This is PodKit, episode 39, 170% Lack of Confidence, on Thursday, July 5th, 2018, and now. Part of the branding is confusion. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersad. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk39. Zing. Lack of confidence? Long time no talk. Yeah, it's, it's been, been a while. while. WWDC happened. That's true. We was there watch. was there was there any hardware? Uh, nope. I'm trying to th- make some joke, but it just didn't come. Oh no no no! There was hardware. I can't believe you forgot. Apple made a new watch band. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> oh yep. no! Yep, they did new, watch, a new watch band. That's almost the same thing. You could say it's about time. <laughs> Zing. Yeah, so no big hardware, but there are lots of other goodies. Uh, you can listen to the nexus.tv slash NS59 for our WWDC 2018 Nexus special. Ryan and I discussed a lot about what happened. We didn't go into detail about everything, but we covered a lot of stuff, at least mentioned most of the big stuff. Nice. Um, any thoughts while we're on the topic? Um, I think WWDC was good um, from their software perspective. Um, the new Mac operating system Mojave looks nice. You know, just uh, good overall polishing features, so that's fine. Um, I can't say anything about iOS because I don't use iOS, so... Mm-hmm. Uh, Mojave has Marzipan at least started. Um... Um, incidentally, I am running the iOS 12 beta on my iPad. Nice. But I don't use my iPad, so I can't say for sure what's different. Uh, I've I've been pretty happy with it. I've I've taken the perhaps daring step of running iOS 12 on my main cell phone. Ooh. Um, because for whatever reason, I can bear to spare the phone I use all the time and not the ones I use for uh, development and testing. And that's not <laughs> the first time you've done that either. No. That is not the first time I've done that. that, that um, see, that sounds like a quandary, but it's actually perfectly sensible. Right, right. And I've actually heard phone, I don't need to worry. I've yeah. actually heard that um iOS twelve beta is one of the most stable betas they've ever had. And Mojave. That's very true. I think they're both like rock solid. Um, yeah. So I know like uh High Sierra rewrote Windows Server in Swift. Mm-hmm. So there are some larger level system things that were changing. I don't know if that's the case in these OSs, but presumably yeah. if they're more stable or not, I, not as unstable. Right when WWDC happened, um, I was in the middle of kind of a time-sensitive project. Um, so I was, I was like, ah, I'd kind of like to upgrade to Mojave, but um, I, I didn't really want to jeopardize uh, things like Xcode not working yeah. or Homebrew not working. That would be um, bad. So, uh, so I, I kind of left that at, at, the, at the wayside for for that time. I keep thinking about it, and um, there's like a possibility I might be picking up a, a used Mac Mini at some point. Ooh. Um, the four-year-old version fun. or even older? Uh, probably the four-year-old version, perhaps okay. even older. Um, but but we'll see. Uh, it depends on how... Just be uh, careful with those. Like It is brutal doing anything actually on those because um, there's no solid-state drive. It's just pure agony. Right, right. I have um, two nails that I've filed off that work to slide open the motherboard to do a solid state and RAM upgrade in one of those if you want. Brian, I didn't I know. know where you I've were going to go before. with those nails. I had no idea where this was going. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't know if you were making a metaphor for what kind of agony it was. <laughs> I have a large collection of, of uh, like like uh, wall-hanging nails if you need to <laughs> agonize yourself further as well. I see. Perfect. Multi-purpose. Sounds great. I'm in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you could say he nailed it. Yep. yep. This is true. Zing. You can just edit that out. Um, uh, that's a good one. So should it's we not going to happen. Should, should we get into some of our interesting topics? Sure. Cool. Yes. So I hear you are an IT buddy. I'm an IT buddy. Can you describe what that IT position buddy. is? So formally, oh, it's not like a form. I don't know. So there's a, I'm kind of assigned as an IT buddy to an intern at my work this summer. Um, 
she's a student from a, another Midwestern college um, working for the summer full time. Um, she's on a not my formal team, but close by. And so I'm kind of involved with the project, spending some extra time helping her out and just um, being a, a technical resource as well as someone who can answer questions about like work things and how would you do this? What does this mean? What is that? And so it's been quite nice. Cool. Fun to help someone learn about it. And then myself too, being able to teach something and go through the process of setting up an application again. And, um, you know, every new project has new challenges. So it's been kind of fun to play around with some of that and help her figure it out. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. I've actually, um, been working with multiple interns this summer. Um, so in my previous project, which was about chickens, um, I was working on um, a mobile app with React Native and Expo, and Ew. those two interns were actually on that project. Um, mm-hmm. And I think one of them is from St. Cloud State, and the other is from some other school somewhere. I don't, okay. I don't know. Um, but it was really cool to to work with the interns, and um, you know it. it it's really interesting um, being on a team with interns because, like, the first couple of weeks, you don't know what you're supposed to do with interns. Right. And then, you and know... they don't know what they're supposed to do either. Yeah, exactly. And then by in a month later, you're like, wow, man, we're so glad you're on the team. I'm so glad we have more people working on this stuff now. Right. Yeah. So your interns work on your own projects and things? Yeah. Because um, for my, my large team, all of the interns traditionally, myself included, when I was an intern on that team have kind of been on our own projects, mm. kind of working, you know, by yourself a little more or with maybe other interns. That's not the case this summer. So yeah. I think like with the code and stuff, I'm definitely the person who she works with the most. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that was more the case a few weeks ago when, I don't know, she's like seven weeks into it now, but you know, the first few weeks I was spending a lot more time helping her out. And now she's, you know, understanding things a little more has learned the basics of React. And so, that's good, but I know a lot of the other interns in my company work on teams and are just doing sprint work with, with that team. And mm-hmm. so that's, you know, a different experience. I think there are ups and downs to both, and it's just how the team wants to do it. Yeah. yeah. Last year, um, when I was on a different team, um, we had a group of four interns, and only one of them actually had computer science experience, like any programming experience. And it was yeah. minimal wow. even at that point. So the other three were um, sort of PMBA like they weren't they weren't on a technical track they were more on a business IT track okay um and so they they kind of learned the three of them learned from the other intern who did know how to program stuff like how to program sort of like hmm. and they c- kind of just did their own little intern project um but i think um as a group we all sort of decided let's never do that again let's actually have them work on stuff with other developers that are part of the real products we're making Mm-hmm. I think yeah, I think you do learn more when you're working with, you know, when you have other resources and people who are familiar with the code base. Yep. Um, the team she's on doesn't have any web applications, you know, modern mm-hmm. target architecture kind of things. It's a lot of support that they do, and this is kind of starting the process to automate out a lot of the support they have to do. But you know, there aren't there isn't a resource on their team who can technically help with the project. So, me and another coworker kind of helping out a little bit. So um, is there only more is there only I one am. intern with with that person? Like, is it just a solo intern? Um, yeah, for my yes, for mine. I think there are twelve interns across the company this mm-hmm. summer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I try to encourage the avoiding that. It's it's really nice when you can have two working together some of the time at least because not all of the primary developers have you know all the time in the world necessarily. So it's good when they can ask each other for help and just think about stuff on their own a little bit. Yeah, totally. I think, um, that's kind of one question I had for you all about, um, kind of what, what that workflow is like. Um, so when I, when I was an intern, um, I actually haven't worked with engineering interns, um, since I became a full-time employee. But when I was an intern, um, there was one other engineering intern and we worked together a couple times but um, we kind of had different sets of experience, mm-hmm. which made it kind of uh, difficult for us to find places that overlapped enough for us to um, kind of even work on the same projects. Um, 
which sounds kind of weird, right? You'd think that there'd be a lot of web stuff, for example. This person had a lot of game dev experience, um, which I was interested in, but the, the, the game dev work wasn't really uh, necessarily there always um, in the same way. Um, so that's kind of one thing that I was, I was going to wonder about too. Like what, when you run into folks who have differing experiences like that, how is that usually handled by, by the company? I guess usually that's handled in the hiring process in part, Mm -hmm. but simultaneously, right? Like Ryan, you mentioned that there's like a BA intern or a project management intern as well. Yep. Um, So last year was our first time doing internships with, um, like this team didn't exist two years ago. And last year was the first year they did internships. So, um, and the first year they for, kind of forgot to ask like hey um so what what what's your major and what do you know already and so by when they got there like oh you don't know how to program well that's cool we'll make it work yeah. um we do a little bit better now at screening and knowing you know approximately what the skill levels are and you know they go through kind of a, a light interview process and that kind of stuff mhm mhm nice i think um i'm not super sure so don't this may not be 100% true I believe there's, you know, a pool of interns that an intern committee hires and they kind of go through and vet them. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, an email goes out to managers who are interested in interns saying, uh, what kind of experiences are you interested in? Or, you know, they might have asked interns what they're interested in and things like that. Um, so I think that's where some of the matching is, maybe. Um, it just happened to be that uh, the intern I'm working with, she's in- interested in more front-end stuff. Mm-hmm. She didn't have... I think she did a little JavaScript before, but not too much, but had done a little bit of HTML and CSS. So she had that as a base, but you know, learning React and Redux has definitely been the the most struggle point. And then, you know, things like doing end-to-end tests and yep. unit testing. And, um, and so there's just a lot to learn. And so I'm doing my best to help her understand it, but there are some times where I'm like, you should try to figure this out. She spends a day fighting with protractor and things and then like today i came in and she's still having problems so i spent 20 minutes and kind of finished it up that's and i think you know there's it's some of the trick about being a mentor in that way is you know you don't want to be stuck up on the things that don't matter as much yep like end to end tests and so now there's a good example that's in her code base that she can refer to Mm -hmm. for the future and i think that's what's going to be most helpful Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. So I, one one of the observations that I've had with our interns is initially, so this is the experience with one of the interns for sure, and maybe both of them, I don't know. But initially in the first few weeks, you know, I, I got the impression from, from one of them that like, yeah, you know, all the all the develop, developers that are already here, so like the, the actual team, like yeah. we're all experts and we know everything front to back perfectly and we all have it, we all know all of it and we all know how it all works <laughs> And it's all great. And we know everything. Wow. We know exactly what to do. Um, and then and then after the first few weeks, the bitter reality set in. And I tried to explain, like, we have no idea what we're doing, actually, it turns out. Right. Um, and now um, I think I think the intern seems to understand, at least, that you're right. You guys don't know what you're doing, but you did a good job anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. I think the intern called me a quote front end god today <laughs> right <laughs> in a, in like a half joking way but right but it but it's, it's and, like, it's, and huh. it's that kind of thing like there's there's like there's this um you know it's kind of like how knowledge is sort of an exponential curve kind of thing so like mm-hmm. you can only see so far ahead of you but you just don't know how vertical it gets eventually like there's just That's so much true. to know yep very true very true uh well for my part i uh, Space isn't uh, having an internship program this year, which makes me sad because I, I was an intern, um, and I like it when there are interns, because that's that's how I got here, and I don't know. It's a good way of, you know, yeah. of hiring on junior developers who are already kind of, you know, by the time their contributions are really deemed as um, you know necessary to be, like, you know, top quality kind of stuff, which is never really the case. I mean, everyone's always learning, but... Right. Um, they already kind of have experience with the company and learn it. Our, totally. our interns were pumping code into prod within four weeks, I think. Like, we were desperate for more people. <laughs> right, right. And I think, like, there's definitely a balance that um, that 
companies have to run into sometimes uh, with with stuff like that. Like, uh, I I've seen teams before that are very heavy on, um, you know, lowercase s senior engineers, right? Like, not necessarily. I know what you mean. With with the title of senior software engineer, but like um, the. But like there are not any junior engineers, basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nobody below mid level. What is what is that called? Um, is that the the nerdery engineer? Yeah, I guess you could say that. Oof, I guess you could say that. Brutal. Sorry, uh, nerdery yeah. folks. Yeah, I, I, I didn't I uh, I didn't name the names. You named the names. <laughs> uh, I also did the interviews, so maybe I yeah okay. There bye. you go. Suffice suffice it to say, no, I I agree with you. And like the thing you run into there, right, is um, a lot of like it all of a sudden becomes very difficult to hire anybody junior because everybody senior is busy with everything. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, so we, we, we had that issue and we had to figure out a way to make it work. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like there seem to be plans to make that better, which is cool. But like, I guess that that's part of why I'm sad that there are no interns because an internship program is a great way to like, um, to find people who are uh, interested and raring to go and then can alleviate some of that pressure. Well, on, uh, I also think that the internship the stuff also gives the the, act- the core staff, the actual teams, yep. an opportunity to go out and teach stuff they like doing, exactly. which you don't normally get to do as a developer making products. Totally. It's, yeah, agree. it's fun for the mentors, too, to have you know a, an interesting, unique summer of... There's out. nothing a developer yeah. likes more than telling another person how to develop something. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and uh, my one of my mentors uh, is now no longer with the company, um, which has probably made that particularly poignant that there are no engineering interns this year. Because I'm like, oh man, can't even hang out with uh, the person who I hung out with during the internship. Yeah. But so it goes. Um, so I guess the TLDR there is internship programs are cool. I'm really glad to hear that you guys are um, like having positive experiences with the interns uh, at at the companies and yep and uh, that that is cool stuff. It's cool to be able to teach folks like that, as you said, for sure. Yeah, I was lucky enough to actually get to interview our two interns nice. before they started, and I think we selected these two from a pool of you know like six others or so, and. Uh-huh. You know, like the the bar wasn't even very high. Like, could you could you over the phone make complete sentences, and could you tell us about some computer science classwork? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. it's pretty low bar. Um, mm-hmm. And and the, these two interns, they've they've done great work already. And uh, I think I think as a group, they they know parts of the application better than some of the you know real people on the team, mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. is amazing. It's great. Yeah. Interns are great. This is true. This is true. So this kind of leads into another topic that I think we all we all have uh, something we want to talk about here about um, kind of uh, code sprawl and um, how that affects like the learning process when somebody hops onto an existing project um, that has you know uh, a pretty large history lots of commits or um you know a long-running pr with lots of files changed um brian it looks like you wanted to start here i think ryan hi oh ryan oh sorry (laughs) i don't know our names are very similar i don't i don't know sometimes the skype i mean uh the hangouts what what do we use here Slack? slack i'm not sure anymore um facetime did i write that originally huh who knew (laughs) <laughs> um, I didn't, I didn't know. I thought I, it was here when I got here. Um, yeah, that's funny. If I wrote that in the past, I wrote what I wrote after in the future. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, this is getting really weird now. Um, well, so he, one of the interesting things is, so we've been working on this react native app for about six months now and yeah. apparently cold code sprawl. What a word was on my mind when I wrote this. Um, but what's the experience like for beginners in school and or in boot camp? So in other words, when I was in school, one of the things that I, I had, I have kind of like two impressions from the U of M computer science program. So one of them is we don't spend enough time reading code from other people, whether that be good code so that somebody says is good or even bad code that somebody says is bad, let alone peers and mentors code. So right. 
reading other people's code is a really great exercise because it teaches you that nobody has a clue what they're doing, but also that you have to think in a certain way when you write code so that the person who takes over for the person who takes over for you can read it. Mm -hmm. And that's not something normal people think about when they start coding. Um, So what's it like for a beginner to start coding in the real world when it's not just a simple little project with one or two files, but when it's, you know, like a React native app, when it's, you know, 80 files long when they get there, let alone, right. you know, 150 files by the time they're done. You know, it's just a really big, big thing, especially when you're an intern, for example, and you just kind of get told, go optimize this app. Oh, gosh, what a goal. <laughs> right? Um, and I can get, give you some details about that in a little bit, but it's just so, it's so amazing about um, the difference of scale and complexity that school tends to provide and what the real world tends to thrive on. Mm -hmm. Um, I was lucky. I was different. So I I didn't mention it in the previous section about internships, but I never had an internship. But I've been coding my own fairly complex thingamajigs for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So this was never really a big deal for me. Like I've understood apparently the word sprawl. Um, Now I would kind of characterize it as urban decay, so I'm not sure if that's right. different or the same. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting experience and an interesting thing to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I kind of had a similar experience. So when, when I was an intern, I focused on a React Native app as well. And um, it, it, it was really awesome to be able to learn from some of the folks who had originated the React Native app. Um, and, you know, now I'm kind of at the point where uh I have a, a pretty thorough knowledge of the code base to the point where, yeah, the you know when arcane things come up, I, I need to refer back to the code. But sometimes I can even pull some some of the locations of certain things out in memory, mm-hmm. which I don't think that's a thing to be proud of. But do you, did did you use happened. a pointer? Yeah, yeah, lots of lots of pointers. Um, unfortunately, there are lots of uh, uh, null pointers also in my brain. Oh, but, that's uh, unfortunate. We'll, we'll we'll figure it out at some point. Um, but you're, you're totally right. When you put an intern to work on something like that too, I think there can be some really cool things that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. So apparently, um, when I wrote this the first time there were 70 files changed. Um, and I was actually one who made that PR and I have no idea anymore what that PR is now because it's long gone. (laughs) Uh, it was approved. I can tell you that. Um, oh. but when you, but when you think about 70 files, like when is that a small change? Like how many files do you need to have? Is that like 500 files and then 70 is like no big deal? Um, you know, what if, what if you're making changes that happen to touch all of those files for some legitimate reason? I guess it happened. Um, you moved one file and then <laughs> had to update all of the import statements in 60 some I, other files. It's, right? it's all relative to what you're doing. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're, rewrite the application and it's five files that's a pretty big commit where yeah you're updating a path in a couple of files and it balloons out to many right i've had my largest commits are either like implement a linter which hits you know every file. files yep. or it's something like implement this new framework release it when it's not under a flag and then delete the old framework that's when i have things where i'm like three thousand deletions you know changed 60 80 files or something right, so it's all right. kind of relative to what you're doing yeah I, I i have some additional thoughts here too so it doesn't just happen when i code it happens when other people code too totally Pe- i mean it just happens in projects especially when um a team is new to a task like it's the first time anybody on the team has ever done this before um right. but other things to watch out for is why was something changed in this particular way. So, you know, as Brian says, if you're adding a linter, but you don't document that you were adding a linter, and you just say, made changes in your commit message. Well, You need a good commit message. That's not a good... That one might even call for a body in that commit message. I agree. Um, Added linter, added ES rules, blah, 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 and made changes to meet standards, blah, blah, blah. Um, Mm -hmm. Maybe something like that. Um are you guys familiar with squashing oh yes i i uh i squash git commits all or the time. I, I guess i've done it that's, once that's, that's secret terminology for rebasing i'm sorry atlassian 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Or uh, what? I did it once the uh, Monday actually for that blog post. There's nice. an edit that I was about ready to post. For more I mean, information about Brian's blog post, please listen to the Fringe. Yes. Um, I um was getting ready to post. I mean, I wasn't going to do it because I people hadn't like signed off on it yet. But um, the the post author had like run it had run it through marketing a little bit and had to change some things. I'm like, I probably shouldn't commit that history the marketing changes that went in. So I, yeah, it was, I, I wish there was a shortcut to it. I think what I did to do, I committed it, then checked out master merged in those changes and then reset my tree. Yeah. Rebase commit back or yeah, rebase it back. Yeah. And then, Added, did the changes and then committed it again to a new branch. Yeah, so it's we not as I wish there was just git squash. How many commits back? Well, so so for example, Atlassian on Bitbucket has this very feature. So you can do a normal merge where it keeps Ooh. the history, or you can do a squash merge, which will make all of the incoming branches commits go into a single commit with a new message, new mm-hmm. new subject and new body if you want. Um, and so normally we just have. You know, like, for example, the 70 file changed PR, it probably had two dozen commits in it over the course of the week. And uh, at the end, I squashed it all down to one commit and uh, I had to give it a descriptive enough um, subject and body for some poor sap in the future to figure out why I did it. Mm -hmm. Um, So let's see. My next interesting note about this is that I have experiences with... So I mentioned making code for the person that takes over for you. Um, And I think that's an important thing to think about early on in a project. And one of the things that I notice, especially with JavaScript, um, particularly on the API side of JavaScript development in Node, is that there's no encapsulating framework to have a mindset around. So, you know, something like Spring or .NET MVC or Rails or Laravel or you know, whatever it might be, all of those things have sort of this brain scaffolding, you could say, um, these set of conventions, and maybe it's not like configuration versus convention, but I mean, there are controllers, they go in this folder, or there are controllers, they get extended by this class, you know, something that lets you conceptualize how a system works, even if you don't know the business logic yet, you at least know and see something familiar, and a lot of what happens with node code is that doesn't exist. So there's Express. Mm. But then somebody's like, hey, I don't want to repeat this the same Express code 20 times. Let's make a wrapper. I don't want to repeat this wrapper 20 times. Let's make a wrapper for the wrapper. And then it becomes a bad wrap, and nobody likes that. That's very true. That's very true. Um, I was looking at um, a Node app recently that I had wrote a long time ago. Um, it was probably one of the first uh, APIs I'd ever written. And I had very much that same experience. I was like, "What? what is this? I don't see... I, I see where the entry point is, but I see all these references to weird things. Yep. Um, and I, what and did, I, did five I, years ago me do? Yeah. Right. And I, and I don't know... And, like, that's just you. What did five yeah. years ago somebody else do? Like, that's even, that's a, an even a harder question to ask, answer. So yeah. what, what I've explained to some of the other developers and, you know, even people on our own team, like, when we, mm-hmm. when we write code... And we know for sure that we won't be around to maintain it. We need to make sure we do it in this overly obvious way. Right. So that there's at least something for somebody else to latch onto in the future. And writing docs is the answer everybody likes to g- give first. Like, hey, let's write some docs for it. But that's not a good solution because the docs get stale in five minutes. Right. Okay, I've got, I've got one more, I think. But yeah. we already did it. So, oh, sorry. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about it. How about that? So, yeah. uh, so again, we had our interns, and we put them to work on real code by their second week. So, you know, the first week is kind of like, you know, we're working with chickens. Um, you know, chickens are a very, very diverse field. Um, the app does this stuff. The service does this stuff. This is the business model, blah, blah, blah. And then here's the app, and here's the architecture. Here's some of our recent decision-making here's some of the unknowns that we're going to have to tackle soon. Um, 
And by their second week, we kind of got them up to speed and they were good. And then we started having them work on their respective tasks. So one of those tasks was handling upgrades in Expo gracefully. Mm -hmm. Um, So our app was going to be used in low connectivity zones. So like the middle of nowhere. Right. And apparently in the middle of nowhere, there's no speed for the data networks. Right. So doing an upgrade on an almost no speed but still having connection connection is agony. Um, so we needed a way to make sure the app wouldn't just be crippling in those situations. And the other work that we had to do is the app was very restful initially. Like every, every resource was totally mm-hmm. discreet, which is great. But the problem with that in a mobile app is now you have 500 requests going out. Right. Which is bad. So the, so part of the work was to figure out a way to, de-restify or make an alternative restful implementation so that we could have, you know, 50 requests go out instead of 500. And and so the interns did this work over the course of a few weeks and it and the results were great and it's just um we had our architect to sit with them and and work with them and um I helped and other people on the team helped over time our QA guys helped um so there's there's a lot of people who helped the interns achieve what they did. But mm-hmm. they still did it themselves. Yeah. That's good. That's a, a good use for interns, I think. Yep. Totally. I should have my intern go through our AngularJS app and remove all these template filters and expressions and move them into controllers and one time bind everything. <laughs> that sounds hard. We have a very high watcher count in some <laughs> places. It's not, nice. It's not good. No. I have an extremely small, uh, extremely short uh, uh, story about how my git commit history got me out of a tricky situation uh, a while back. Go for it. Let's hear it. Let's do it. Um, So on this long running project, um, one day I was talking to somebody who works on, uh, uh, or who's a designer basically, and was asking me about when we made a particular change. Um, And he and I were both talking about this, and at some point he was like, you know, I feel like you and I sat down and we made a change that was this very specific thing that I don't know what happened, but I'm just, I'm not seeing it anymore. And I was like, yeah, you know, I feel like I remember making that change too. Where did that, you know, where did it go? Let's find out. Um, And I remembered that, like, basically every time I sit down with this person and make a change, I'll put in the commit body, I sat with this person, insert name of person here, uh, and we made the following optical changes, right? Um, And uh, sure enough, I searched and I found like 50 commits where it was like, Brandon sat with this person to make the following changes. And, you know, that's a really kind of a goofy commit body, right? Like, it's probably overly verbose. It probably wasn't, strictly speaking, necessary. But in that time, I happened to find out, hey, these are all the changes that we made. Um, And, yeah, we did make that change at one point, and we reverted it out for these reasons. And, um, like, I don't know. That was just really cool. And it was something that I don't think I could have found if I didn't, you know, have maybe kind of a little bit of a ridiculous commit history. The other thing that I thought that was really funny about that is when I searched that, I found a bunch of other commits from other developers who did the exact same thing. Mm. <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, know. that's just, that's a good case of the more data you have, the more you can use in the future. Yeah. I'll sometimes totally. do a commit with kind of thing. Yeah. That's really you, cool. I like that, you, that, I, that pattern. Yeah. At least you, you commit with your account, but you say it's another person and then GitHub shows it as two people committing to oh. it. So on uh, in in Bitbucket, um, if you do a PR and somebody approves your PR, it'll yeah. sign the PR approved by person. Yeah. It's kind of similar. Hmm. Yeah, I guess the trick with this is that uh, designers don't have Git access, GitHub access. Ew, um, those poor poor designers. Yeah, uh, they're they're probably pretty fine with it. <laughs> um, yeah, they have, they have enough things they have to enough different software as a service providers they have to deal with, um, but. Uh, no, that, that was really funny. And it was kind of funny to see the different styles, too. Because, mm-hmm. like, I, I would be pretty matter-of-fact about it, but someone would say, like, this person's feelings. And, that like, that was all that they'd say. But it made it really easy to be like, oh, 
I know what happened here. This person gave feedback to this person, and they implemented the feedback. And I know that um, I, I know where the feedback came from um, because the content of the feedback is already in the commit. I don't need an itemization of what what the content of the feedback was. Um, so that's kind of fun. Cool. Yeah, that mining mining Git history is very fun. This is true. This is true. There are a couple of tools I've used, just like uh, Git quick stats. There's some some things out there. Just you know, a lot of it mirrors what you would see on GitHub and things. You know, just how many contributions you made. Yeah, yeah. But you can see like you know when your first commit was, what it was, who's committed the most proportionally mm-hmm. in terms of number of commits or uh, lines of code added or removed. And it's just it's cool to to look through when you're working on a project that has multiple developers on it. One of my totally. favorite one of my favorite things about um, looking at the Git stats kind of stuff is seeing who forgot to set their git username and git email address <laughs> yes even though oh, they've been man. told to repeatedly is it like machine name or no it's worse it's somebody else who host. created uh, the I, can't, VM? I can't say who it is but it's worse they'll know they'll know <laughs> they'll know uh that happens a lot with vms for me so like somebody will create a vm and you'll commit and it'll be like this person committed and it's like this person is you know uh you know this person's no longer with the company why are they committing still and it's because somebody who created the vm is like oh saved in the vm oh gotcha. well so it was it was it was his wife's computer so it kept saying his wife's names committed <laughs> like a hundred times and it's like oh, oh. okay then how did this happen interesting huh. <laughs> that's funny yeah I have two GitHub accounts, which doesn't help me either. Oh, I um, I feel your pain. I should have just switched my username, but I. So decide, have have, yeah. have you ever like tried to set um like for a specific repo like specific Git username and email? I've done that sometimes. Uh, particularly does it on work? work stuff. It does work. Because so I've long, tried it and it doesn't work. It doesn't transfer across computers. No, but it but, also hasn't worked for me. Oh, huh. Yeah, I guess I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. So, do you do it in the terminal, or do you make like a Git file somehow? Uh, I do it via the terminal, but it's a local Git config hmm. that's uh, stored inside of the dot Git folder. Yeah, which is why huh. there's a problem. Yeah, I just <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't work for me. But basically, I'm supposed to check in all my code with my Doherty email address, but I've just started using my RyanRampersad at gmail dot com address because. <laughs> That's where all my own code gets, you know, linked to. Right. I I only do work stuff on my work computer. I and I do everything on every personal. computer. Yeah, space is pretty lenient, or not lenient, I guess per se. But like, work stuff should be done on your work computer. But um, accidentally, you, it happens everywhere. You can also, yeah, you can you can like, sp- space is pretty um pro doing cool stuff and sharing it with people and most of that cool stuff comes for example from my uh personal github account which is tied to my space github account so which is maybe too much info about how that works but i guess whatever. i guess it would be easier if i didn't have my personal github um or my personal git credentials yeah um as the default ones that would also right. probably help right So Ryan, I've seen on Twitter lately you've been doing some carrier experiments. Uh, yes, this just started maybe even yesterday, and by the time you listen to this, last week. Um, so in a in a while, I will in a non determinate period of time, I will be traveling somewhere, um, which is um, said to be in the middle of nowhere. Um, not only f- might there be chickens around. No, there won't be any chickens. <laughs> It'll be a different bird. Ironically, though. Um, can't say which come back in november um but so i'm going in a, on a trip and um presumably t-mobile won't work there because it's in the middle of nowhere and mm-hmm. it's uh not a metro area and it's not a small metro area and it's not really a city or a town it's kind of a middle of nowhere kind of you know kind of place kind of like a cornfield almost oh nice. yeah hmm. yeah so usually there aren't 
service providers in a cornfield except the big red V. I mean Verizon. Um, yes. So Verizon might work. So um, yesterday, actually maybe it was Tuesday I bought it. It was a Verizon SIM card. You can actually get a prepaid Verizon SIM card for just $10 at your local Target. Nice. And um, for $50, you can get uh, 7 gigabytes of data and then um, unlimited texting and calling, which don't matter really. Right. Um, Because who wants to call people, I guess? Um, If you have dial-up internet, you might need to call. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully it's not that bad where I'm going. Um, And so... um, I'm, I'm actually, uh, I have both devices right here, so Brian mm-hmm. and Brandon can see them on the screen. Yeah. Um, here, here's two devices. And so one of these is the S8 and the other is the S9. And um, I'm going to bring both of those with me. So one will have the T-Mobile SIM and one will have the Verizon SIM. And so I've been carrying both phones around for the past two days. And it's really yeah. bizarre carrying two phones around like this. And both of them having actually working connections. Nice. And because the way I am, I set up the phones the same way as the yeah. previous phone. So every time I get a new phone, it's I copy ex- everything I can exactly as it was and yeah. then make minor modifications over time. Right. And so these both phones are very similar, but they're just out of sync enough to annoy me. And it's hilarious. <laughs> and um, I also can't always tell which one I'm using at any given time. Mm-hmm. So when I'm sitting somewhere and I'm like, why why isn't the thing i'm looking for here and then i have to look at the back because on the two phones <laughs> that's they have the different, identifying feature they have different yeah. back camera layouts one has one camera you should and the other really has two cameras you really have one that's not red <laughs> no 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 part of the brand things. the branding must remain <laughs> um i guess the part of the branding is just confusion too um so yeah so when i go on my trip um out to the uh, middle of nowhere um where the birds don't fly um I will have two phones with me, and maybe I will be able to uh, live a normal life with cellular data. Nice. Best of luck. Yeah. And have fun. I will do that. Well, I think that just about uh, concludes our main topics for this evening, um, which means it's time for everybody's favorite segment, our new Twitter followees. Woo-hoo! We still need a little jingle for that. Oh. One day. Someone someone who has a singer friend should find someone to record a nice th- clip for us. I, I don't I don't have that. We will take files in the bodies of a tweet tweet <laughs> us at us at the Nexus T V and uh we'll pick our favorites. They have to be uh seven zipped and then base sixty four encoded though. Um that's that's the only requirement. Yeah, you have to embed the file inside of an itty dot bitty dot web that site. Uh, URL. That's a callback to the fringe, which you should listen to. Nice. Well, so Brandon, you're up first. Yes, my first Twitter followee is at ReasonMLCat, uh, <laughs> and wow. as its as its bio says, it is a cool cat that likes ReasonML. Uh, so if you haven't heard of ReasonML, it is like uh, I, I would probably say that it is an ML family language of sorts that uh, interoperates with JavaScript in some interesting and novel ways. Um, there's a there's a particular, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, project of the Reason project called BuckleScript yep. that uh, compiles Reason uh, to JavaScript, more or less. Um, I, th- I think that's a fair statement. Um, I've tried this out a couple times. It's really cool. It kind of gives you an... Uh, a more ML-like way to write something that is basically kind of sort of maybe JavaScript and interoperates really well with things like React uh, and Redux. So um, Reason is kind of cool, but Reason ML Cat uh, tweets a lots of very entertaining pictures and quotes. About... Are, are you on the run, Brandon? Uh, that would be uh, me. Oh, I'm yeah. to say. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> uh, I mean, yes, always, but um, but not today. Uh, but the reason an L cat um, tweets some fun, uh, fun, fun quotes. Like uh, the most recent one is a picture of the reason an L cat taking a nap that says, "When the types are just right." So my favorite fair. one was when I find about your mutable state. Yep, um, that's a very good I think, one too. I think you might have retweeted that because I saw it earlier in the week. Yes, I did retweet that because yeah. it was very good. That was probably what got that 
account to follow. Yep. Uh, additionally, uh, I followed uh, James Voss Grummish, who is a web developer in town here. Um, he's giving the talk at Minneapolis Junior Devs in nice. a couple weeks uh, or next week, uh, and that's going to be super cool. Um, I'm really excited. It's going to be about estimating software, um, which you know is is one of those things, or estimating for software development, which is one of those things that I think. Um, Black magic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's this paper. I I don't know if you all remember this. It's possible we talked about this on a previous episode. There's a paper that says like if you estimate zero, you're actually going to outperform any other estimates. Yeah. Um, which uh, I keep trying to find because people keep trying to ask me to estimate stuff, and I want to show them that paper. Um, I think we need to make, make that a topic sad. on our next episode. Yeah, we might need to. We might need to. I have so many things to say. R- right. 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 Uh, and there's like that thing where you can estimate something with like 70% confidence, but then like the 30% confidence can quickly become 170% uh, lack of confidence. Yep. Uh, and that's that's where the problems lie. Anyhow, so I'm really excited for that event. It should be cool. I'm going to be running the doors. So uh, yeah, if you have tickets, see you there. If you don't have tickets, there's a wait list, but there are no more tickets. Um, surprise! <laughs> surprise! Kind of like Open Source North. Okay. So, hey. You're that supposed really to do the awesome, zing though. thing again, I think. Zing. There you go. <laughs> no, that was really cool. That, that was really cool. It was good to see that they uh, sold out uh, sold out of tickets. Uh, so my last Twitter followee is Functions Conference, which is in uh, my favorite city in the United States. Uh, that's not in the United States. That's in Canada, uh, which is <laughs> Toronto. Toronto kind of is my favorite city in the United States, but... Uh, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, United States of North America, right? It, that's true. It is neither <laughs> here nor there. Uh, it's it's uh, it looks really cool. Um, and the reason why I followed it is because uh, it's a conference that uh, is kind of focused on uh, serverless, and it looks like they have people who know what they're talking about there, which is sometimes a rarity when it comes to serverless stuff. You bet. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm pretty excited, uh, even though I'm not going to go because I can't go to Canada uh, for a long time uh, <laughs> because I've already gone to Canada too much. But I really like Canada. Did I mention I like Canada? Canada's Been kicked out great. now because you think it's part of the U.S. It's so no, I don't think it's part of the U.S. I think it's <laughs> magnificent country. <laughs> yes, and that uh, that just about does it for my Twitter followees before I uh, get hauled away by the police at Brian's. <laughs> it wasn't me i swear it was the mountie so good all right so for me i follow out uh maximilian whose twitter name is at max has adhd he's an ios developer who develops the app television uh shoot the twitter i think it's television time and cinema time yeah or movie time gosh what is it called my home screen i can never figure it out but uh, or on uh, the iPhone, the app names is TV Time and then Movies. So it's just uh, movie and TV tracking apps. I think there's a, a reviews app he makes as well, but I have not used it. Um, so just tracking, you know, what TV shows you're watching. I've been using a, that TV app a lot lately. I was yeah. using another app made by some other developers, but it's kind of been abandoned and crashed and it's looking for something else. And this seemed to be the one to get. Um, so it alerts me when new TV shows are airing and I keep track of which episodes I've seen in the season. I can see when shows are airing. It's great. Uh, the movies app is kind of the same, except you can mark what, which ones you've watched. You can rate them, things like that. So super, super nice. If you're into watching TV shows and movies, uh, the next person is Joe Carlson. He goes by at Joe Carlson one and that's Carlson with two S's and an O and an N. Uh, he gave a talk at JavaScript Minnesota, a lightning talk uh, a couple months ago. He gave a talk at Open Source North. I don't know. He's a local guy. I figured I should follow him after I saw him talk twice. Yeah, I think yeah. he was working nice at Target guy. recently. I don't, I don't know where yeah, he's working I think he's, right now. I think he's a developer or manager or something like that at Target. Um, yeah, he's a nice guy. has a good speaking presence. That's cool. Yeah, Check him out. Definitely a cool human being. And last person is Tyler Patterson. He's a um, engineering craft manager at my job, and he's a cool guy. He's he has a Twitter. He followed me, so I followed him back. Um, yeah, 
he has some good thoughts about um, the industry and etc. Cool. Nice. I have one Twitter followee. <gasps> one whole followee. <laughs> one one. I see. I don't follow people. It's risky. So this is Robert Mason, who did the most recent JavaScript Minnesota talk about Rust and WebAssembly, yeah. which was just maybe a week ago or two weeks yeah. ago. I don't. It, I don't know how it, to it count. will be two weeks ago. Don't know how to count time ago. anymore because of the future. I'm with you. The, which is the end of June talk. Which is funny because the talk before that was about time. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was really cool. Uh, good, good talk. Um, yep. That's it. That's that's who I follow. Awesome. Well, where can we find you guys on the internet? Or not the internet? Anywhere. Uh, let's see. Well, you can find me uh, just slightly north and west of my present location um, uh, in beautiful, historic downtown Minneapolis. Every time uh, you make that joke at JavaScript Minnesota, I always wonder, how many people are getting this? I think it's a solid 1%, probably. Which is funny, because the show is 99% invisible. <laughs> I'm you glad you got 100%. that percent. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Uh, the the 99% of the attendees, which are also invisible. Uh, no, they're pretty visible. Because <laughs> we're developers. They are pretty visible. No, they're pretty, they're pretty great. Um, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Other, other than in real life, uh, or sorry, other than in meat space. Uh, hi, Ian. Hi, um, Ian. <laughs> you can find me on the internet at brandon.mn, which is my website. Replace the dot with an underscore, and you've got my Twitter handle, brandon underscore mn, where you can also find me on Instagram, Snapchat, um, I don't know, I, pretty much everywhere else on the internet that supports underscores as usernames, uh, or underscores in usernames, rather. Uh, or you can find me on GitHub, uh, which uh, is linked to from my previously mentioned website. How about you, Ryan? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Mar, and of course on my website, RyanRampersed.com, where I post about nothing at all. It's a static website, and it never changes. <laughs> nice. Sounds about right. That sounds like my website, where you can find me, which is BrianM.me. I haven't posted a blog post in a year and a half. Oh, well, or well, longer than that now. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at BrianMitchL. I'm also on Instagram at Brian Mitch L. Because Brandon called it out, so I thought I would too. Ayo. And let's see here. Um, we have we have some uh, homework to do here at the end of these shows. Do you do you know uh, what episode this is, Brian? This is Podkit thirty nine. You can find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash pk thirty nine. Cool, Brandon. Do you know what kind of social media platform open discussion about these episodes might be on? <laughs> Why yes, it's on Wikipedia. No, it's on uh, Reddit. Uh, uh, Reddit dot com slash r for Ryan slash the Nexus TV. There's no dot there. It's just the Nexus TV. That's yeah. our subreddit. And it's not actually r for Ryan, but I agree. We'll go with that. And <laughs> and of course, you can also support us on the Patreon by going to Patreon dot com slash the Nexus TV. There's also no no, no dot there. And uh, over at the Patreon, you can uh, enjoy some tiers of stuff and, I don't know, Esky and Arbuck on Twitter for details. Or check out that link, and it has all of the tiers listed out. We appreciate any support. Sharing, liking, commenting, hating, whatever Twitter, you want. Twitter. Just use Twitter. High-fiving in yeah. real life. High-fiving yeah. in real oh, life. If someone high-fived me in real life about, my pot, about like our podcast... That'd, That'd be, be awesome. Amazing. Well, Brian, you weren't there at JavaScript Minnesota. We told somebody we were we had a podcast for like four years, and they were like, "Whoa, that's amazing!" Yep. Oh, uh, the one time I'm not at JavaScript Minnesota. I know. Next time. Next, Next time. time. Next time. Next time on Podkit. High fives. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yep. Well, until next time, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. That's true. It is neither here nor there.